Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. What a beautiful time of the church year that we get to be in right now, basking in the glow of the resurrection, living amidst the joy that that, what that means for us, not only eternally, but right now for us as the children of God. Let's rise as we begin our worship service today. We begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Ever one God, world without end. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. If we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in your presence, away from the noise of this world. You are truly the great God who is above our earthly understanding. In the midst of a broken world, you put into reality the events of Christ's birth, death, and resurrection, so that all the world would have access to the gift of eternal life. How great is your love that you have lavished on us so that we are your children. Open our minds to understand the scriptures which you have given to us. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. As we open up God's Word today, we come to Acts chapter 3 for our first reading. And we come at the tail end of a story where a man who was lame from birth had been granted the ability to walk by the disciples of Jesus in Jesus' name. And seeing this, it starts to work on the minds of people who were there. They had been in Israel over the time of the resurrection, but this moment had made God real and present before them in their life like it did for the guards who had seen the earthquake at the time of Christ's death and said, truly, this is the Son of God. Like the disciples who were in the room behind locked doors and thought they saw a ghost, but Jesus comes before them and they touch his side and they understand who he is. God became real for them in this moment. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this and he said to them, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you all can see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Our second reading for us today from the book of First John speaks to life as we have it right now. We are in the now but not yet. Already at this moment, you are called children of God and have eternal life opened and given to you. But we are not yet like Jesus, free from sin, glorious and lifted up in the glory of our eternal Father. This is what, John, this is what we are told in 1 John. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. 
Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Please rise out of reverence for our holy gospel. Our gospel today comes from the gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter. We've seen the power of God and the lame man who is given to walk. Now Jesus comes before his disciples and speaks to them a message that is surpassing their own understanding. He says, peace be with you. It is not like their childlike faith that they currently possess. They are children of God, but they don't understand what that means. And so Jesus gives them the power of faith, gives them the wisdom and understanding of who he is and what he has done. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high join together in confessing our sins before God and one another. We come before you, O Father, acknowledging who you are and who we are. How great is your love for us. Forgive us when we do not live as your children and try to live by our own power. You offer us peace, but we are troubled, and let doubts get in the way of our faith. Forgive our ignorance and help us to turn to you in all circumstances. As Jesus opened the minds of the first disciples to understand the scriptures, so open our minds that we may know your will for us. Send us the power of the Holy Spirit that we may be able to witness to your resurrection. In a world which seems so preoccupied with death, may we show where real life can be found.
Lord God, open our hearts and minds and give us faith that we might live boldly to be your children, awaiting the promises that you offer us in your kingdom. Our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I remember vividly my last year studying to be a pastor at St. Louis Seminary. Now, how it works in our church body, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, is the, the seminary process is a four-year graduate degree. So if you were coming straight from college as I did, you would be roughly 26 years old, having been in school your entire life. And how it goes is you do two years of classroom instruction, and then they send you off to a one-year internship. Katie and I were punished by having to go to South Florida and Boca Raton for a year. But then, after going out and doing the job of a pastor, essentially out on a one-year internship, they bring you back for one final year of classroom instruction before finally, at the end of the process, receiving your call to go serve the church somewhere uh, out in America. And I remember this time, because after being in school my entire life, looking forward to this time of being a pastor, I'd been training for seven years at that point specifically to be a pastor. I remember dreading having to go back to school for one more year. Waited so long. There's so much coming in the future. Looking forward to what not yet was. But I remember going through that year, and there's so much anticipation towards the end of it, so much looking forward, that by the end of that time, I remember specifically appreciating what was there, that at the end of this long journey, at the end of this many years of school, this was the last time that we were going to have all together as a seminary class, some who I had gone to college with and been with for almost eight years to that point, to just hang out together as friends, uh, to talk to the professors, some of the wisest men in our church body who we got to learn under for many years, to go to chapel together and be built up in, in the Word of God every day. And I remember, though I was so much looking forward to what was not yet, being able to settle in the, the months and the weeks that I had left to dwell in what was, the blessings of God that were given us just then in that moment. The now, not just the not yet. The now but not yet is one of the greatest paradoxes of the Christian life. We celebrate the resurrection two weeks ago and we know what the eternal promises of that will be. We will be with God in heaven forever. We will be in a new earth. New heaven and new earth will be made. We'll be free from sin. We know these great and glorious moments are coming when all will be made right in the world. But yet, we're still here on earth. We're told we're blessed. We're told eternal life has already come to us now. God has blessed you and given you promises that you already have. But not yet for the fullness of what that will be. Our epistle lesson today from 1 John speaks to this now but not yet moment. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Dear friends, we already are God's children, but he has not yet shown us what, what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. 1 John says we already are God's children right now. That is living in the now. God has blessed us as his children. But we will be like Jesus. Not yet. So what does it mean to live in this now, but not yet? Well, if we are God's children now, what does that mean? Being God's child means you are chosen. That the great creator of the world has looked down your, at you, his creature, and has said, I choose you. You are part of my family. You are 
my child. You are chosen by God. That means you are loved. One of the things everybody in this world searches for to be loved. We desire so much. You don't have to do enough to be loved. God has already chosen and said, you are my beloved. I have chosen you. You are already loved by God. Chosen by him. You've been adopted by the most high God. The creator of all of this. The one who is powerful over this entire world has adopted you into his family, grafted you in, chosen and loved you. You are redeemed. That means that whatever your life has looked like before, whatever guilt or shame you might have, he has redeemed it. He has taken it to the cross with him, and in his death you have died to death. That just as he has risen from the grave, you might rise anew as his holy family. That sin has been redeemed. That sin has been forgiven. You have the ideal parent. We say God is our holy father. You are his child. And this is the ideal parent. In this life we experience a great magnitude of different parenting. Whether your parents are great or they're awful. Whether you have, you, whether you see all of their flaws or only some of them. God, our heavenly father, is the perfect parent. He is perfectly gracious and generous with you. He is perfectly wise in giving you what it is that you need. He is perfect in his discipline of you, not out of frustration or out of spite, but for your good and the good of all who are his. He is the ideal, the perfect parent who has adopted you into his family, called you, chosen you. These are the gifts of God that are already yours right now. You are a child of God. But there's another side to this. We are a child of God and we are very much children. What does it mean to be children? Well, we have our own children and we know a little bit of what that experience is like. As children, we are not fully mature as we will be. We lack knowledge and ability. We lack perspective. Sometimes we don't know that. After all, a child doesn't know why, uh, why they can and can't do some things. It just so happens in their life. We lack the ability or the knowledge to know truly what is going on in our life or the perspective to see what God is doing, how our good heavenly Father is acting upon us in our life. Sometimes we lack the knowledge and ability or even the trust to know how, how our heavenly Father is acting. And because of that, we often fight like children. I learned in a psychology class that we learn, we develop how we process conflict by the time we are five years old. And that means that even as we grow up and mature in life, oftentimes when we come into conflict, we still are dealing with it like we did when we were five years old. We fight like children not matured unto what we will be, not matured into how our Heavenly Father might have us. We often fight like children. We do dumb things like a child. That is, we have not fully matured to act as the perfect child of God that he has created us to be. As Paul says, we still do the things we don't want to do. And the things we want to do, we do not do. We do dumb things like a child. Because at times, like children, we lack the, the full perspective, the knowledge, wisdom, understanding to behave as a mature adult, a, a mature child of God. We lack the, the delayed gratification that comes from maturing in the faith. We have a childlike mindset, whether we acknowledge it or not. We are children of God, and God is a gracious and patient heavenly Father with us. You know, this past week I've been on vacation with my own child. I really just wanted an excuse to put this picture up there. She was the coolest baby on the strip in Las Vegas. But as I got to spend more time with her this past week, it was interesting to note uh, how she values what we value. 
That is when we're sitting around uh, on the couch or, or on the bed, the one thing that she wants more than anything else is mom's phone because she values it. She sees that mom values this phone, that mom thinks this is important, that she looks to and does things on it, and so she will reach for it, she will grab for it, she will suicide dive over anything to get to it because mom values the phone. If we're on the couch and watching something on the TV, she values the remote because her parents value that. Would it be as children of God that we respond in the same way? That seeing what our heavenly father, father values, that we would value in the same way God's other children, God's own family, his word and the gifts that he gives to us. That we would value what our heavenly father values and like our own children, reach out, grab for it, suicide, die for it, to value what our heavenly father values. We are children of God. This is who we are right now, at this very minute. But you will be like Christ. What does that mean? It says, you will be like Christ. This is not yet. You will be eternal as Christ is eternal. Not just in this life, but in the next. You will be lifted up. With Christ. There's a beautiful scene in Revelation of not just Christ at the right hand of his God, but all of believers gathering together with God in the throne room of heaven. You will receive the glory of God when you are like Christ. Not yet. You will be in the presence of God. The final promise is not that we will be out on a beach relaxing somewhere or out at an eternal golf course, but that we will be in the presence of God forever. And this is a good and glorious thing. You will be in the presence of God unto eternity, free from sin and all of its effects. That means free from pain, free from death, free from sorrow or any tears. These are all the gifts of God that we know are true. As surely as Christ is risen from the grave, we will have these things. It is the promise throughout Scripture. We had two funerals here yesterday, and we proclaimed this, that Christ will raise up uh, all who are in him, and that he will take your body that is mortal, that is fleshly, and it will be like his glorified body. You will be this. This is the not yet. This is the off in the distance. This is the great hope. That death will be defeated, our king is alive. There will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no any effects of sin on us in our life. This is what we have to look forward to. So as God's people now, we see what lies ahead, yet we live in the now. We live where our feet are. Be where God has placed you. I think back to, again to that moment where I was at the seminary, very clear-eyed on what was ahead in the future for me. And it was good. It was better. I was not meant to be at the seminary for my whole life. God help me if that was the case and I had to be in school unto eternity. What was coming was better. And I should look forward to it. I have, should have clear eyes for what that is. And just like us as God's people, we are clear-eyed knowing what is ahead of us. The great glory of God that is coming to all who are in Christ. That is for you, but not yet. Now we live in the great promises of God that are already yours. You are a child of God. Loved, chosen, redeemed. And so enjoy that childhood, knowing exactly who we are. We might not always get things right. We might not always have the, the proper perspective. We pray for faith. We pray for trust. We pray for wisdom and understanding from God that he would teach us and be patient with us like a good father. But we live in the now, enjoying the relationships we have together in this interim, in this time, this now but not yet. But we're clear-eyed knowing what is coming. The great promises of God that are for us. We live in the now but knowing exactly what is to come. Now in this peace which passes our understanding, we keep our hearts and our minds in this one true faith from now into life everlasting. Amen. Let's rise as we confess this faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Please rise as we continue our worship today by joining in prayer. As we lift our cares and concerns to our Heavenly Father who hears them, let us pray. Lord God, in your presence, we find fullness of joy. And by your right hand in Christ, you win and deliver peace forevermore. In the midst of this world's sin and sorrows, give us peace in the knowledge of our salvation, confident in the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Lord, in your mercy, <laughs> Heavenly Father, by your incarnation of your Son and the reconciliation of his cross, you have made us your children. You've gathered us into your holy church. Sustain the preaching of your word and its message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name among us and all the nations of the world. Lord, in your mercy, Give peace, Lord, to our homes and enliven them by Christ's resurrected life. Let the forgiveness of sins reign among husbands and wives, parents and children, and assure those that live alone that they too are your children, upheld by your right hand. Lord, in your mercy. God of all comfort, you have compassion on those who are afflicted. Remember and have mercy on all those in need of our prayers, especially those near our risen Savior family today. We pray for those who continue to struggle with health issues, for Tammy Bibler, Nancy Kwan, Marvin Wolf, Don Steele, Daniel Farmer, Greg Muth, Aaron Duncan, Terry and Barb Wieschman, Owen Ragsdale, Kathy Werfline, Bruce Trapp, and Kayleen Veach. We lift up especially the Elsia and Meltzer families who yesterday were remembering their lost loved ones. Give them the hope and comfort that can only come through your empty tomb. We lift up Jeanette Shepler, who's at home recovering from a fall today. Provide quick healing. We pray for all pastoral candidates at both St. Louis and Fort Wayne seminaries, as well as the district presidents and the churches who will receive them. And we especially lift up today the Hillman and Harmon families at the passing of our Lita's sister, Barbara. We give them hope, give them peace. Be with Pastor Tom as he preaches a message of grace and the hope of the empty tomb tomorrow. 
as they remember their life and on Tuesday at the internment. Strengthen them for the days ahead and give them the hope that can only come through you. Be with all those in need of your healing and in need of deliverance. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.
you may be seated. I only have one announcement today, and that is the week after Easter, I was talking to our district president, and I received some very good news. As of right now, Risen Savior is slotted to receive its associate pastor at Call Day in St. Louis on April 23rd. Now, one small word of caution, things can and do change all the way up to uh, the final vote of the district presidents, which happens next week. Uh, But we are very confident in in the placement that we have, and we are excited to learn uh, of the pastor that that we will receive. Uh, And we're going to celebrate here. We are going to have a watch party here at Risen Savior in the Worship Center that night, April 23rd. It is a week from this coming Tuesday a week from this Tuesday at 7 p.m. There's a big service at the seminary in St. Louis, and they announce all of the calls, and we'll hear who will be coming here to Risen Savior on that night. That's again April 23rd at 7 p.m. We're very excited. This is very good news uh, for us, so praise God, and and thanks to everybody who had a hand in, in that process. But it has been wonderful worshiping with you today. Let's greet each other in the joy of the Lord.